Yo, what up? Welcome back to another episode of I went on a road trip and I didn't shoot any Portra 400. Today's episode is sponsored by Squarespace. Yes, it's true. Monica Baxter and I went on a road trip up north for a couple of days. We figured it would probably be good for the boy. All Baxter does day in and day out is sh in the park and sleep. So Monica and I agreed it was time to make him a little more cultured, a little more worldly. To see the wild open wilderness where perhaps his much more powerful and normal legged ancestors roamed. The greater Eureka area is somewhere I've always wanted to visit because of its unique coastal landscape. I seem to be more in my element when I'm doing photography by the coast. Now that doesn't mean I took good photos on this trip, but at least I feel better about them sometimes. But speaking of apathy towards my work, what gear did I bring? This is always the hardest decision of any road trip. I'm sure even Sir Ernest Shackleton contemplated for many nights before his famous Antarctic expedition what cameras would produce the most bangers. Luckily for me, the decision wouldn't take long. Using Monica and I's date night fund, I had recently purchased four new lenses. Two for the Pentax 6.7 and two for the M6. Perhaps the lens I was most excited to use was the legendary 75mm 2.8 for the Pentax 6x7. I don't know about you, but I had never heard anything about this damn lens until several months ago. After that, I just couldn't really shake it from my mind, and I lost a lot of rest because of it. It was kind of like my personal sleep paralysis demon. Supposedly, it's one of the most technically proficient lenses ever made for the Pentax 6.7 system, and it's equivalent to a 37mm lens, which is right up my alley. The other lens that I picked up for the Pentax was the 120mm 3.5 soft focus lens. This is definitely an artsy lens. Uh, it's not really suitable for anything except 80s glam portraits. If you shoot the lens wide open, the glow effect is so strong that it's damn near impossible to find focus. Luckily, when you stop down the lens, the effect diminishes. I thought that this lens might be really cool to shoot with some very contrasty black and white film, and I was kind of right but let's not jump ahead. Lastly, I ditched the Soviet lens that I was using on my Leica M6 and purchased some real Leica glass. I purchased the Sumacron 35mm f2, mostly because everyone champions Leica glass as supreme, and I just had to find out for myself. Also, I picked up a Voigtlander 12mm 5.6 rectilinear lens, but more on that later. Thus, the decision was made for the trip. I would bring the dynamic duo, the inseparable pair, the Leica M6 and Mamiya Se the Pentax 6x7. But enough about how I don't have any money anymore. It was time to hit the road, and since Baxter's legs are short and basically useless, we had to forklift him into the car. We started off the trip with a casual 8 hour drive to go see my family, and boy were my testicles hurting after the long drive, but that might be unrelated. Halfway through the journey, we decided to do the Taco Bell Challenge. If you've never heard of that before, consider yourself lucky. It's when you eat a bunch of Taco Bell and then bounce around in the car right afterwards. The first person to have to stop loses. Burrito Supreme. Okay. Extra Supreme. Being the alpha male that I am, obviously I won. Although I do owe Monica a new car seat and she won't look me in the eyes anymore. Eventually, we made it to my mom's house in an undisclosed town, in an undisclosed area, on an undisclosed planet. Oh good, he still has his appetite. This whole trip would really be my opportunity to experiment with some film. I brought a lot of film stocks that I don't normally shoot. This go around, I was packing some heat in the form of retrochrome, aerochrome, and lomo purple. Speaking of Lomo Purple, the next morning I decided to start the trip off with some funk. I waffle stomped some Lomo Purple into my M6. Does that analogy work? Not really, but who cares. I also slapped an orange filter on the lens. Some rumors have been flying around lately that you can get the aerochrome look with Lomo Purple if you use an orange or a yellow filter. Well, that shit is made up. These shots looked bad. Real bad. Like, let's just put this roll behind us and not speak about it again until maybe we're on our deathbeds bad. Oh, and yeah, I used a quick and dirty photography hack to get the filter to stay on the lens when I brought the wrong step up ring. Thank you. 
These shots actually turned out okay, but for sure, I wouldn't recommend this combination. Unfortunately, my birthday was coming up and my cat was busy harassing me. As a gift, my mom stole an Edward Hopper painting from a museum for me. The next day it was time to hit the road further north to the Arcata slash Eureka area. To break up the four hour drive a little bit, we stopped at a local pizzeria and ordered a prosciutto pizza as per a recommendation that someone gave me, but they told us they were out of prosciutto. A normal man might have been very upset by this, but I shoot film. My heart is used to being broken every time I go into my local photography store and they're out of color plus again. So as a way to draw in any local bears for some excellent wildlife photography, we got a pepperoni pizza and found a spot to eat it. With some Provia in hand and the 75 millimeter on the body with a one quarter Promist, I loaded the behemoth. Shooting with the big ass Pentax 6x7 exudes a certain kind of masculine energy. It's a, yeah, I clogged the toilet, so what kind of energy. So I think I concluded here that it's not a good idea to use a Promist with Provia or likely any slide film. It somehow kind of cheapens the look of the film and the lens. I mean, these photos probably wouldn't have been good regardless, but we're here to learn from my mistakes. We stopped at a nearby gas station and I noticed a super cool hotel sign across the way. I went to take a photo of it and there was also a lady there taking a picture on her phone. She said to me, if you like taking pictures of signs like this, you should drive Route 66 sometime. After freezing up and some quick PTSD flashbacks, I said, yeah, I'll have to check it out sometime. After blasting through a Taylor Swift album, uh, I mean Bruce Springsteen, we arrived at the hotel. Before the sun set completely, we wanted to take Baxter on a walk, but more importantly, I wanted to finish the Provia that was in my Pentax 6x7. Which I did, but I hate it. Fifteenth of a second, hopefully it's not blurry. <laughs> The 
The next day it was time to celebrate the anniversary of the day I was born, which doesn't really seem like something that should be celebrated because things have been going steadily downhill for me since then. But alas, I was feeling myself and I loaded some aerochrome in the complete darkness. This is technically my last roll of the original four rolls of aerochrome that I purchased way back in the day, but I'm happy to let you know that I now have three more rolls in my possession. Anyway, with the orange filter applied, we ate the crap out of some crepes and then headed further north to a place called Fern Canyon to f up some aerochrome. Do you know how to spell the word sequoia? S E Q U O I. Damn it. Sadly, I had to go in alone because they don't allow good boys in the canyon. So Monica and Baxter frolicked on a nearby beach. I ended up taking a shot of this tree twice, once earlier and then once later when the sun was actually hitting it. I don't know which one I like better, but it's definitely the first one for some reason. This place was without a doubt one of the coolest places I've ever been. This place is f***ing cool. And to be shooting aerochrome here was a dream come true. You ever take a photo and it just hits? Yeah, me neither, but this one ain't half bad. One thing I was a little worried about with the infrared aerochrome film is that Ideally, you want to shoot it in direct sunlight, and the canyon was mostly shaded. I also took a picture of these pink thorn shits and they turned out yellow. It seems that red and pink objects turn yellow with aerochrome and it's a vibe for sure. Eventually I met up with Monica and Baxter on the beach and took one final photo of the coastline with aerochrome. It's definitely one of those shots that looks pretty normal until you look closer and I think that's kind of awesome. Anyway Baxter wouldn't stop eating sand for some reason so we left the beach. But not before I loaded some Fuji Industrial 100 into the Leica M6. I've never shot Fuji Industrial before, I've heard mixed things. Upon first impressions, it seems pretty desaturated and neutral. After a super dangerous whitewater river crossing in Monica's CRV, we made it back to the highway and headed north. We arrived at the Trees of Mystery, and while we didn't go in, we certainly admired the monuments to Paul Bunyan out front, even though it looked like he clearly just witnessed some real sh**. But 
but it was totally worth it because we got some ice cream and Baxter got to meet his hero, the giant blue ox and his gargantuan sized nutsack. Down the road a bit, we stopped at a small fishing town for sunset. Baxter clearly did not have what it takes to hang. shot with the Fuji Industrial in my M6 as we headed down towards the water, but as I finished up that roll, I put in some retrochrome because why not? It's the shit. I'm not super big on the stop sign trope in photos. I kind of feel like it's becoming an overused crutch. However, I just couldn't refuse the placement on this one right next to the shore. Honestly, every frame on Retrochrome just looks amazing. I'm sorry if you disagree, but whatever, you're wrong. Eventually the roll of retrochrome ran out and I hot swapped in some Ektar 100. Ektar and I have a storied past, which is mostly rage filled, but that's a story for a different video. Lately I've actually been trying to ignore these ugly ass modern cars in frame because I know that in 20 or 30 years they'll be more or less vintage. Well maybe not anything Kia makes, but for everything else it's just a waiting game. The sunset light eventually got there. Photographers, you know what I'm talking about. As the sun set, we raced towards the only familiar thing in town, beer. The next morning, it was time to hitch our wagon elsewhere. I threw on the 12 millimeter Voigtlander because we headed back out to some nearby redwoods. Unfortunately, the light was a bit too dim for the 100 speed Ektar and the 5.6 speed lens, so a lot of the photos are underexposed. At 1 15th of a second, a few turned out usable and they were gloriously wide like your mom. Now you might be like, why in the hell would you shoot ultra wide lenses? Here's the deal. Edward Hopper is still the tightest mother 
motherfucker to ever live. But lately I've been binging some work by Richard Estes as well. Richard Estes is kind of a gangster. He used to walk around New York City with what looked like a Linhoff Technica and just shoot photos. I mean, if great art requires suffering, then I imagine lugging a 4x5 around New York City will do the trick. Then back at his studio or dungeon or whatever, he painted those photos with incredible detail and they look amazing. However, from studying his work, I recognized a few things that I wanted to emulate in my own work. The first being lighting. We learned this from Edward Hopper as well, that we always want the light to be more or less at an angle. For example, if we look at this painting by Estes of a store straight up admitting that it sells drugs, the lighting cuts the frame in half precisely. One side is lit up and the other is in shadow. This might all seem pretty basic, but I think that the angle of light is the key to making a photo that I'll be happy with. I took this photo on the x a few weeks ago and it's okay. Let's be honest. It's not something to drop everything and break dance over. I shot several alternates, including this one, which angles the lighting a bit more and illuminates half the building. I find this image far more visually interesting than the first. And the only major difference is where I placed myself to shoot the scene. Another thing that I picked up from Estes that's a little more relevant to this video is his use of wide angle. In practice, Estes actually took several photos and stitched them together like a panorama to create the wide angle look. But me being an ultra lazy piece of shit, I figured I would just get an ultra wide angle lens. What I noticed is that the ultra wide angle lens is certainly a style, but in my opinion, it's only useful in certain situations. The key being environments with a lot of vertical objects. In Richard Estes's case, it was the architecture and skyscrapers of New York City. In my case here, it would be the big ass redwood trees. I do actually really like these photos, but I also wish I had a faster film stock in the camera. I could go on for a while about Estes' work, but we ain't got time. Maybe I'll revisit the topic when I actually get the look right, which at this rate will probably be in a couple years. Not satisfied with anything at all ever, I slammed another roll of retrochrome into my M6 because my thirst for weirdly saturated but desaturated film was not yet quenched. Anyway, it was time to head south a bit to Mendocino. As we got closer, we realized that the coastline was shrouded in clouds and fog, but it was about to be shrouded in some dank T-Max 400 because I was about to go hog wild with some black and white. So we stopped at a lighthouse and I threw the soft focus lens on the Pentax 6-7 to give the scene a bit more diffusion than what was already present. This shot looks straight up like a painting and I'm totally here for it. The lighthouse was pretty cool. The lens up in the tower was even cooler. I don't know if I would jerk off to it like they did in that one movie, but four out of five stars for sure.
Anyway, it was time to check into our hotel and go for a walk along the coast. I shot with my 75mm 2.8 and a 1 quarter Pro Mist for these bad boys, and of course, T-Max 400 as well. Scenes like this are so much fun for me to shoot. With the fog rolling in, all you have to do is just fire the camera. The atmosphere and the mood of the scene kind of just takes care of the rest, which is perfect because I prefer maximum results with minimal effort. This shot of a boulder is one of my favorites for some reason. Yes, it's true that the pioneers used to ride these babies for miles, but I think the way that the water wraps around the bottom makes it work really well. Anyway, it was finally feeding time once again. Instead of the usual date night at Long John Silver's where I pretend like I forgot my wallet and make Monica pay, we headed to a local seaside eatery. That evening, Baxter cleared all of his appointments for the night and napped harder than ever before on the human bed while we slept on his dog bed in the hotel that I paid for. The next morning, I only had one goal, to kill off the retrochrome that was still lurking in my M6. Like an angry wild boar instinctively hunting for ground-dwelling reptiles or birds, I also instinctively knew that retrochrome looks gorgeous with vibrant reds. So I shot these umbrellas and the photo is pretty damn cool. I loaded up some T-Max 400 in the Pentax and started off with the soft focus lens, but soon switched over to the 75 and 1 quarter Pro Mist for true sharpness. The soft lens is great for a certain look. Unfortunately, that look is a bit limiting. I don't shoot a lot of portraits and I can't imagine the look kind of working well with color film and my overall style. Alternatively, the 75mm is an incredible lens. I just wish they weren't so difficult to find. Honestly, I'm starting to think retrochrome is like my own personal cheat code to make any drab scene look amazing. It probably also helped that Monica was wearing a burgundy jacket. Anyway, eventually we made it back to LA and all was well. I hung up the Edward Hopper painting in my apartment and it is now a shrine. This road trip was a lot of fun and we're definitely planning another one with Baxter. Although we might avoid the beach next time as Baxter has found sand to be a delightful delicatessen until it passes through him and he shits out a sandcastle. I wish I was joking. But before we go, I'd like to quickly thank today's sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace is an all-in-one website building platform and a convenient way to set up shop for all your photography needs. Many moons ago, I was lost. I didn't have one place where all my work could be displayed online until I found Squarespace. Setting up a website to host my portfolio was a breeze because they offer hundreds of professionally designed templates for you to build off of. And best of all for me, you don't need to know how to code or design a website in general to get started. Squarespace's intuitive user interface makes customizing your own website a walk in the park. And if you do know how to write code for extra customization, Squarespace even offers a module for that. If you want to take your domain a step further, you can even set up a one-stop shop for selling prints, zines, books, 
etc. It's all right there in the design interface. So what are you waiting for? If you're ready to build a website, you can start a free trial today at squarespace.com slash grainy days. And if you use the code grainy days at checkout, you can get 10% off your first purchase. So that's it, folks. Now that I'm 30 years old, I think I'm going to go chug an entire pint of Ben and Jerry's and then immediately regret that decision.